I remember once my grandma told me that I was going to absolutely destroy my kidneys because I was taking creatine when I was, I don't know, 18 years old. I remember her telling me that, you know, I was on steroids and that that was just going to destroy mm -hmm. my kidneys. Those are the two things I remember from, from my grandma. And I, now that I've got Dr. Darren Kandow here, who's one of the leading researchers in the world of creatine, we want to go through some of the side effects of creatine and some of the things that maybe are thought to be mm -hmm. side effects, but aren't quite. Let's start with this protein one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or excuse, let's start with this uh, this kidney one. Right. You know, because I think that's a big one. I've seen it on Instagram. Creatine's bad yeah. for your kidneys. Like, where did that come from? And what does the data actually suggest? Today's video is sponsored by Seed. If you're worried about your gut microbiome, you're trying to make some changes. But ultimately, if you're trying to add carbohydrates back into your diet after doing low carb for a long time, very important you take care of your microbiome. So that link down below saves you 25% off of Seed's Daily Symbiotic, which has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. So a capsule inside of a capsule. Super interesting technology. Very, very cool to check out. So they also fund a lot of microbiome research. So they put their money where their mouth is. A lot of the proceeds go back into research because we're trying to understand what these little microbes in our gut do and how important they are. So anyhow, it makes a big difference, made a big difference for me. I don't usually recommend probiotics because a lot of them are garbage, but this one's definitely worth a shot. So that link down below is in the top line of the description for seed. Yeah, this is kind of taken on a life of its own. So the theory is that since the kidney is the, the main organ that starts the process in creatine synthesis, that by taking creatine, it was gonna wreck your kidneys. And I think a lot of us, when we go to the blood, or uh, get an annual physical and you get blood work, there's gonna be something on the blood requisition form that says creatinine. And when creatine is put in our muscle and it breaks down with exercise, it's released in another compound called creatinine. And that is highly used by a lot of nephrologists and general practitioners to be an estimation of kidney function. Well, what they don't tell you is when you take creatine supplementation, creatinine levels have to go up because you have more creatine in the muscle. And unfortunately, from a medical practice standpoint, if you have more creatinine in the, in the bloodstream, that's an indication that your kidneys are not filtering it like they should. So lo and behold, a lot of people would take creatine, go to their doctor, have high creatinine levels, and the doctor would say, you've got to stop taking creatine supplementation because it's killing your, your kidneys. And so the theory was there, but the problem is when you stop taking creatine, creatinine levels go back to normal. So obviously your kidneys were not impaired with functionality. It was just a byproduct of creatine metabolism. Um, and so that's where it all stemmed. And when you look at study after study, different dosages, long periods of time, there's no effect compared to placebo on creatine causing kidney, liver, or any other type of renal abnormality. Do your creatinine levels eventually come back down? Okay. They do because yeah. you're reducing the amount of creatine that's coming into the body. So a lot of people get something called an estimated uh, GFR test uh, at the, with their doctor. Um, but if you're going to do that, please tell them you're on creatine supplementation. You're well aware that creatinine levels will be elevated acutely. And that could cause an alarm or false alarm. And um, we see this time and time and time again. Um, and it's just a product of creatine metabolism. Got it. Okay. Well, the other big one that's one that people are well aware of uh, is, uh, you know, creatine is going to make me go bald. I mean, that's a big thing. I mean, it's absolutely uh, perfectly valid to uh, to think that, right? No, so, right. What, what, what's, what's going on there? Where did that myth come from? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I was going bald before I took creatine. Was, we'll talk about that after. So it comes back to this one study. There's, and again, there's over a thousand studies on creatine, but there's one signal, a single Sunday uh, from Australia where they looked at rugby players who took a high dose of creatine for seven days, and they measured a hormone called DHT, which is derivative or precursor from testosterone production. The interesting thing with DHT is it's increased naturally with resistance training. Um, it has been implicated in hair follicle loss and thinning. And lo and behold, when they measured the amount of DHT in, these young, in this young population, uh, DHT levels did go up with creatine compared to placebo. However, it was within the normal physiological range. And just because a hormone goes up means nothing. So if, I'll give you an example. You can have a hormone go up regarding muscle protein synthesis, but just because testosterone went up after post-exercise, that does not correlate to an increase in muscle mass unless it happens accumulating over time. And lo and behold, DHT went up, uh, but no measure of hair follicle loss or, or stimulation uh, occurred. And that's the only bit of evidence that has been linked to this myth. 
and it's probably the most popular myth worldwide. It's a question I get almost on a daily basis. And since creatine, and there's no evidence to suggest it, and, and I go back to sort of subjective data that I've probably worked with a thousand people and not a single person has ever come to me on long-term dosages and said my hair is thinning. And I think those people, that would be one of the first things that they would, they would say. So right now there's no current evidence uh, to suggest that creatine causes baldness. Yeah, you never know. I mean, in that particular study, what did their training demand uh go up or down even right. that week. A lot of times you see like in training demand uh, decreases mm -hmm. and things kind of get a chance to Correct. recalibrate. Testosterone levels come back right. up when they're not taxed. Were they right. in season? Were they yep. off season? Was at the end of the season? Yes. You know? And I know in a lot of athletic settings, they uh, they do a lot of testing in the uh, in the off season specifically. So were they, you know, what was their training like? So exactly. it's a very difficult thing to be able to, you know, could have been a million different reverse yeah. causation going on there as well. Genetic predeposition. Now there's a lot of things with that. So, and it's ironic that no other study has ever assessed it. Uh, and that's something we still need to do ironically. Yeah. So, okay. What's, uh, what's another one that comes up all the time? Probably another big one is muscle cramping or dehydration. So this has huge implication for athletes or exercising in hotter environments. So one of the big myths was that where creatine will take water from the bloodstream into the muscle area, people thought to dehydrate or, or, or increase muscle cramping. Uh, well, you would flip that around if creatine is causing muscle to come into the, uh, or sorry, creatine is causing water to come into the muscle environment. It's super hydrating the muscle and that will decrease the incidences of dehydration and muscle cramping. So that's probably one of the bigger myths as well that creatine could be a very viable strategy in hotter uh, uh, months during the summer, for example, when training outside, and that could uh, sort of hydrate the muscle and that could cause uh, a decrease in dehydration, metabolic stress, and even muscle cramping and strains. And that might be, it sounds like, that might be one instance where creatine can have a little bit more of an immediate effect. Correct, yes. Uh, almost, well, within a few hours, it will cause water to be, be, be uh, taken into the muscle within about two hours. So that could have some application, um, especially as we approach the hotter summer months. Yeah, so it's something that you could almost pregame your, uh, correct. your you know, outdoor activities with. That's correct. Yeah, while we're on this same topic, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably good to address the other sort of it's viable is mm -hmm. going to be the water retention, yes. right? Uh, and that's, I know it keeps a lot of ladies away from, from touching the stuff. Right. A lot of times guys don't care. That's like, oh, whatever, I'll, I'll retain a little yes. bit of water if it means I get stronger. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my wife, um, you know, her, her doctor, who's awesome uh, for even suggesting this, is like, okay, yes. you know, yeah, go on some creatine. It might help you with your, your cycles and recalibration and right. things like that. It might help with your energy. Um, and she was concerned that she was like, I don't mm -hmm. want her to gain weight. I don't right. want to have water retention. Uh, why is that actually happening? Because yeah. it's in the same vein as the hydration discussion. It's a very viable concern. It's probably one of the main reasons a lot of younger females primarily will not take creatine. And that's primarily around the loading phase. So a lot of regimens will do 20 grams a day for five to seven days. And by taking that high volume of creatine, that will cause what we see is an acute water retention, primarily intracellularly in the, in the muscle. And that can cause an increase on the scale. And a lot of people don't like that. If you don't want to have any chance of water retention, or water or, or uh, body weight gain, I would suggest a smaller dose more frequent throughout the day. Um, so again, three to five grams a day is a very effective dosing strategy from a muscle performance perspective. And that will reduce any chance of water retention. So I think the loading phase is only for those individuals that really need a rapid acute burst, so to speak, if, if a, a world championship is coming up or, or something that's uh, demanding. But from the average person, a lot smaller dose throughout the day will accumulate. Uh, that'll probably uh, not result in any uh, water retention whatsoever. And that's probably something that may uh, motivate individuals to stay with creatine more often. From a, back to the hydration aspect right. then. So, I mean, if that's kind of understanding how it's working based on, you know, basically uh, drawing sodium in as well, can having a small amount of carbohydrate with it improve the hydration aspect of it? It can, because every time you take in one gram of carbohydrates, you store about two to three grams of water in the muscle. So combining carbohydrate with creatine can almost give you a super hydrating effect. Okay, and then of course there's a, it's got the glycerol aspect as Correct. well too, which is kind yeah. of interesting. I know right. some people in long uh, ultra runners will do right. creatine, glycerol, sodium, and right. glucose. Yes. And that's kind of their little secret yep. cocktail. And it definitely, when I do it, I get GI upset from yes. that. That's too much. Yes. But uh, I've seen a lot of people in the ultra world do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay, what's, a, what's another myth that we hear all the time? Oh God, there's many. Um, one is it's not an anabolic steroid. Uh, it has anabolic properties, but a lot of people thought it was a steroid at first and, and no, they're 
totally different uh, derivatives with that as well. It can also have enormous benefits across both sex, so males and females. Uh, a lot of people were speculating it was only for males, and, and now we're seeing great benefits for young females, middle-aged females, and now postmenopausal females into late years, having huge beneficial effects on muscle and, uh, performance and as well as bone health. Um, and the other one is during pregnancy, there's some evidence from Australia that creatine can have some beneficial effects for the mother and for fetal development, um, but that's in its infancy in an area that we definitely need to, to improve on. Uh, it does not have any detrimental effects on the liver, very similar to the kidney as well. Um, so there's a lot of potential myths that we've put out some papers to try to dispel those based on evidence-based research. Yeah, the other one that I've hear, heard all the time is uh, is acne, which oh, yeah. that probably just comes again from the DHT discussion yes. there. Yeah, people and also, I would speculate with acne, or some people have mentioned sleep or sleep issues. Um, I think with creatine, you probably engage now in an exercise training program, which can cause a stimulating effect, and maybe you might be slightly dehydrated or overhydrated, maybe change your diet. So I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, when people take creatine, my theory is that they're also engaging in exercise and maybe at a higher intensity, which can cause mm. some stimulating effects to the uh, metabol or metabolic rate. Not to mention, you know, oily skin and Correct. not taking a Sweating. shower right after Absolutely. a workout and not keeping it, you know. Um, then a potential, I guess, not even necessarily a side effect, but a a risk, if you want to call it, the risk of being a non-responder. Mm -hmm. So the uh, non-responder is purely based on muscle. And there's good logic to this. So unfortunately in our muscle, we only have a maximal storing capacity for creatine. So the average person stores about 120 to 140 uh, grams of creatine in, in their body. Uh, vegans are a lot less, and, and there was a, uh, in 1992, one individual got to about 185. But those individuals were about 70 to 80 kilograms, and nowadays we have a lot of really fit individuals, 100 kilograms, 120. So the maximal storing capacity of muscle seems to be finite. That means we have a maximal amount. And if you're eating a lot of red meat or seafood, uh, if you're synthesizing a lot, you probably have a lot of creatine already in, in the muscle and you might have a small area of improvement. Uh, if you're on a carnivore diet, uh, from a muscle perspective, you may not respond. On the other hand, a responder is someone when they consume creatine supplementation, they get an improvement in muscle mass, uh, strength, endurance, power, so on and so forth. We see the best improvements in vegans and vegetarians. And the logic there is they have half the amount in the muscle, they have double the capacity to respond. We don't know a responder or non-responder from a bone or brain benefit yet. This is only from a muscle performance perspective. Interesting. Now, speaking of the, the bone side of things, mm -hmm. like that's actually news to me. I did not realize that there was such a benefit uh, to bone health. Is to, why is that? Yeah, this is probably the, one of the main areas of focus in our lab recently, and it's primarily focused on postmenopausal females because they're more susceptible to osteoporosis or frailty as we get older. And just like muscle, when you combine creatine and resistance training, um, you get an increase in muscle mass, but we started to see an improvement in bone mineral density and primarily bone strength. Uh, and so that has huge clinical applications. If you take an aging bone and make it stronger or more resistant to fracture, uh, when that individual would fall on an icy road or fall inside uh, um, their house, uh, they may not suffer a fracture. And if it's around the hip, that's very uh, debilitating from a physical activity perspective. So creatine or the bone cells that are osteoblasts and osteoclasts, they actually rely on creatine just like our muscle for energy. They turn over quicker and then the bone building process can occur. Um, so there's a handful of studies, and we've done some really good clinical work, that creatine seems to decrease the rate of bone mineral density loss in postmenopausal females, but it also increases bone strength in postmenopausal females and older males. So now it's starting to have some bone beneficial effects over time, and we think it reduces bone breakdown, and it might have some beneficial effects by improving the bone remodeling process. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, another, another uh, big hurdle for people, mm -hmm. and I hear this one a lot, is creatine is going to increase the uh, potential for you to gain fat. Yes. Uh, very big one that comes up a lot, mm -hmm. and maybe it's stemming from the water retention, maybe it's just people being misguided, but uh, how do we address that one? Yeah, so the, the good thing is we have a couple studies, uh, one that's been published and one that's in uh, review right now, and we've looked at adults from 18 uh, above that engage in creatine supplementation resistance training. And when you look at all the data and do uh, perform meta-analysis, uh, creatine had a beneficial effect on, by reducing percent body fat in adults 18 and above, and it had a small reduction in absolute body fat. And some of the mechanisms 
organisms where if it increases muscle mass, that might correlate to a greater energy expenditure. But there's good animal data to suggest that creatine can actually uh, improve mechanisms directly uh, related to fat metabolism, improve mitochondrial health and oxidation. It might have some implications in proteins involved in beta oxidation. So here's a compound with exercise. That's the key. You can't take creatine and hope it's magic. Um, it might have some muscle building perspective uh, benefits, bone. Uh, we've talked about brain and now actually add in the body fat perspective and you might get a synergistic effect on improving body composition. And if that allows someone to uh, improve activities of daily living or stave off metabolic diseases, I think that's a huge potential uh, that we need to look forward to as we move forward. I mean, it's safe to say, I think caffeine and mm -hmm. creatine are the two most researched sort of ergogenic supplements right that's I'm, correct if yeah. i'm not mistaken yeah. you know and you know the only one that's i don't even know anyone that are that are even remotely close to that so yeah it's, so at the end of the day i mean as far as people that have watched this video but maybe mm -hmm. not the other videos uh just a, a general dosing strategy for people that are now not concerned with creatine after watching this video yes yeah, so i think you can go three ways i think the average person that is just looking for the beneficial effects and they're the average person that goes to the gym three or four days a week or play sports you can take as little as three grams a day move it up to five grams a day from a muscle perspective take that every day even on the days you don't work out and you can live your life you know very happily and very uh, optimally uh, but that now, if you're looking at it from a bone and brain health perspective, I think overall 10 grams a day uh, is a very viable strategy from a whole body perspective. You do not need to take it in one 10 gram dose. You can take it in multiple smaller dosages uh, and, and it'll be very effective. But for the athletes that say, uh, I got a world championship coming up very shortly, or I've been asked to try out for a certain sport and I really need to get a boost and, and help. Uh, increased training capacity, the loading phase, which is 20 grams a day for about five to seven days is very viable. It's very fast. The only downfall is it will probably cause an increase in body weight or some potential GI tract irritation. So for individuals that are body weight conscious, UFC, boxing, that may not be the most viable strategy. So I think you can do uh, those two. The one we use a lot is you go on a scale, you see how much you weigh, and we do 0 0.1 gram per kilogram. So if you jump on the scale today and you're 70 kilograms, you're taking seven grams a day. Take it in multiple dosages or take it uh, in one dose, it's up to you. It's very easy to consume. Perfect. Well, uh, Dr. Kando, where can everyone find you? Man? I think the easiest is at Instagram, at Dr. Darren Kando. Perfect. As always, keep it locked in here on the channel. And thanks, thanks my man. Thanks.